have a seat. Well, I got to know, is there anyone excited to be at church today? Awesome. We're uh, continuing our series, The Rebellion, but before we dive into things, I want to give a few shout outs. Uh, first off, uh, every single month we partner with a local or global organization to try to make a difference. And last month we partnered with one of our strategic partners, Thrive. And uh, Thrive uh, provides all sorts of resources for those that, that need some financial assistance. And we were able to collect 459 pounds of food. And they sent us a message. Yeah, you can clap for that. Uh, they sent us a message and said that the food was much needed. It's going to provide 382 meals for Peninsula residents who might otherwise be forced to skip meals or choose between critical bills in order to be able to eat. And so they said on their behalf to let you guys know thank you that you are a huge blessing for providing providing that food. I uh, also want to give a, a shout out to those who serve in the military. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your service. Would you help me welcome our military that's here today? So uh, we're continuing uh, our series entitled The Rebellion, and we kicked it off last week, and I highly recommend that if you miss a week of this series for whatever reason, make sure you head on over to YouTube, and you can find us at Next Level Church 757, and you can always watch the replay of the service, it's on, or the sermon, it's on demand, and I, I highly recommend you do that because each week is building on the week before. So I'll try to do a recap, but it's important that you catch what we did the week before in order to fully get uh, everything intended in this week's sermon. I want to start things off by uh, showing you a, a graphic that I saw a, a handful of weeks ago. I opened Instagram and I saw this graphic shared and it was one of those things that I immediately disagreed with it, but I disagree with a lot of things and I just move on. For some reason, this graphic just stuck with me, and I've thought about it a ton, and I've been thinking about it as long with this series, and I, I think that this graphic has some things that um, really help us better understand this series, or, or at least help us understand what Christians should believe, and what I'm trying to get us to in this series. The graphic's going to come up on the screen, and it says, original sin is poo theology. It was dreamt up by Augustine, and Jesus wouldn't have ever heard of it. You are inherently good, not automatically sinful. And it's by the Reverend Dr. Caleb J. Lines. Now, I wasn't familiar with the Reverend Dr. Jacob, or Caleb J. Lines, so I googled him, and he's a part of what is known as progressive Christianity. And you may have experienced that, or heard about it, or maybe had some friends talk about it. The, the dangerous thing about progressive Christianity is that it should not have Christianity anywhere in its name. Because progressive Christianity typically tends to attack the things that Christians believe. Now, I personally am okay with, if someone does not believe in Christianity and they want to reject the things of Jesus, that makes sense to me. Because you're not a part of Christianity, you don't read the Bible, it's not a part of your authority of your, your life. And so I, I see people all the time will just say, hey, I reject God or I don't like the Bible. And they're not Christians. And I'm like, that's fair game. You're not a part of it. But when someone says that they're from within, and then they start to attack the things that Christians believe, my, 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 my kind of like radar goes off. And I'm like, ah, this is, this is kind of problematic. And there's some things in this graphic that I want to break down for you because I think it plays into what we're doing in this series. The first thing is uh, he, says, uh, he says, he calls it poo theology. Well, what is theology? Theology is the study of God. That's all theology means. It's just the study of God. And so any religion that has any type of study of God, that would be their theology. Christians have a certain specific theology that helps us better understand our God and understand the God of the universe. My wife and I, we both have master's degrees, and uh, hers is from the prestigious William and Mary. Mine is from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And I often joke with her that my degree is way better than her degree. And she's like, how can you say that? No one even knows where your seminary is. William and Mary is like historic. And I'm like, listen, I got a degree in God. God trumps every other degree. I spent two years getting 93 credits learning about God. That's what theology is, and that's what seminary is supposed to prep you for. It is literally the study of God. So when someone comes and says, in the name of God, this theology is not good, you need to make sure, well, they are, on, are they even on our team? Because they're representing, they're saying, 
that they're representing God and they're challenging what Christians believe. So what is the bad theology that this guy claims? He says original sin. This is what original sin is. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, all humans are born into a state of sinfulness. Now he claims that this is bad theology. But if you were here last week, or if you grew up in the church, or if you've even read through the Bible, you understand this is what the Bible teaches. To reject the fact that Adam and Eve sinned, and then all humans are sinful, is rejecting what Scripture teaches. And so if you want to say, well, I'm not a Christian, so I don't want to accept that, then I'm like, okay, I respect your, your ability to disagree. But if you are a Christian, this comes along with Christianity. The original sin, this idea that we're not perfect, we're, we, we are rebellious, we've all sinned, we've fallen short, of God's standards. And then he says in that, that Jesus would have never heard of it, and a guy by the name of Augustine created it. Well, Augustine came around 353 years after the New Testament. So if Paul were around today, the Apostle Paul, who we say is a primetime player, if Paul were to see this graphic when he opened up Instagram, he would have said, hold my communion wine. Let me correct your bad theology, because Paul spends a ton of time in his letters. That was kind of funny. Come on. <laughs> Paul spends a ton of time in his letters pointing back to why are we all so broken? Why are we all so jacked up? Why are we so rebellious? He continually points back to the sin of Adam and how that's a part of all of us. Well, there's the final thing that he puts on this graphic is he claims that humans are inherently good. Humans are inherently good. Meaning, humans are naturally good. Now, I mean this with as much intellectual humility that I can muster. But that statement is a load of poo. <laughs> like, I don't know how you can be honest with yourself as a human being and analyze your actions and think about your life and come to the conclusion, I'm inherently good. Like, if you can come to that conclusion, I want to encourage you to have some kids. Because... <laughs> When you have kids, they are amazing. I love my kids. It's like you, you're, you have these bundles of joy that come into the world. But it doesn't take long for you to realize that cute bundle of joy is a dirty, rotten sinner. And that kid is selfish. I, when my kids were becoming toddlers and we would sit them down to try to teach them how to speak, we would teach them, you know, the basics. Mama, dad, dad. We never once had a lesson with them, said, hey, when you get something and you want to claim it as yours, say the word, mine. We never taught them that. But from a very early age, we would give our kids something and they would clutch it next to them. We'd say, no, 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 you need to share that with your sibling. No, mine. And they're like the, the, the birds from Finding Nemo. Mine, 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 mine. Like, where did they learn that? It's inherited in them. They were born being selfish. They were born. We've had to spend a ton of time coaching and parenting our kids to make the right decision. If they're inherently good, we don't have to coach them or teach them or discipline them because they just keep making the right decision. But if you're a parent, you know that's not the way that parenting works. I was reading about a, a study they did, and, and I wish I could see this. I haven't seen the video clips of it. I've only seen the study. But they, they took a group of 10 and 11-year-olds and they placed them in a home without any adult supervision for an entire week. And it was all male uh, kids, 10 and 11 years old. And they put cameras around the house just to watch what they would do without any parental supervision. As soon as the kids got into the house, all of them agreed, we're going to destroy this house. All of them. They started punching holes in walls. They started ripping furniture. They ate all the food, like just like literally just chugging all the food. They destroyed the house within a couple of hours. That doesn't sound inherently good. That doesn't sound like we're born knowing how to make all the right decisions. And so this is, is, is something that, that you need to under, understand, that if you're a Christian, it comes along with a theology, with a study of God. And the study of God teaches that we are created in the image of God. If you were here last week, you'll remember we learned a Hebrew word for image, which is teslam which means because you were created in the image of God, you have some of God's glory and some of God's goodness in you. That's why all humans have the capability of making good decisions. We all have inside of us the, the, this desire to do some good because we're created in the image of God. But what we saw last week is because of Adam and Eve, humans have rebelled against God. And when humans rebelled against God, everything became broken. 
And it's not just you and I are broken. It's like literally everything in our world is broken. Even the things that are good have little fragments in them. And every time there's a natural disaster and people are killed or houses are damaged, it's a reminder that we are under the curse of original sin. Every time someone you know gets cancer, it is a reminder that we are under the curse of original sin. Cancer was not God's original intention. Every time there's a miscarriage, every time there is hurt or brokenness, every time this world is literally just screaming at us, listen, we're not good, we're not inherently good, we are in need of a Savior. And everything that you see is in need of Jesus and in need of saving. We are all broken, we've all rebelled and fallen short of God's standards. And the answer to fix the brokenness is Jesus. But what we saw last week is that human beings have rebelled against God. We said, okay, I hear you. That's the answer. I don't want that. I want to do, I want to do my own thing. And that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, we're going to look at a, a, a scripture that continues this theme of how we as humans have rebelled against God. And it's literally a theme that's carried on from the very beginning all the way through the end of the Bible. And if you weren't here last week, what you need to know is that the first five books of the Old Testament were written to the Israelites, and many scholars believe that Moses wrote them. The Israelites came out of slavery from Egypt. God delivered them. They went into the wilderness. They spent many years in the wilderness, and eventually they get to the promised land. And in the promised land, God is their leader. And they are to be different from all the other nations around them. If you remember last week, um, all the other nations believed that uh, their king was a form of God, and everyone else was less than. And the scriptures say, no, 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 everyone that you know is created in the Teslam of God. Everyone you know is created in the image of God. And that would have spoke a lot to these slaves, that they have a purpose, they have a reason to exist, they're not pointless. God has created them on purpose and for purpose. But here's something that you need to know that I think is really, really fascinating. For 450 plus years, Israel did not have a king. Why? Well, we saw in Genesis that when God created humans, he was creating them to say, hey, listen, I will be your king. You are to follow me. I'm the one to rule over your life. And I'm the one that's going to take care of you and provide for you. And so everyone else around Israel had a king, an earthly king. And the king would say, I'm divine. I'm close with God. All of you are not. If you want your, my blessing, you need to submit to what I have to say. But Israel was supposed to be different. But Israel still needed some leadership. And so God doesn't give them a king. God gives them judges. And if you read through the Old Testament, you might be familiar with some of the judges. Some of the famous judges that God gives is Deborah, who was a female judge who helped lead Israel. Gideon was a famous judge. Potentially the most famous judge out of all of them is a guy by the name of Samson. He was yoked. He was jacked up. He was strong for Jesus. The final judge, though, his name is Samuel. And Samuel was a guy that tried to lead Israel to follow God. But Samuel has some kids that are not honoring to God, and that's where our text is going to pick up. 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 3. It says, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. I don't know if you caught what happened, but Samuel served God, but he has two sons who do not serve God, and that's what happens when you serve at Beersheba. Some of you are just waking up because you heard the word beer in church. For those of you that didn't perk up, their wives spent most of their time at Wine Sheba. That'll get the rest of you. I'm just kidding. Beersheba is not an ancient bar. Beersheba is the southernmost location of Israel. And if you read through the Old Testament, you'll often hear this proverbial phrase, from Dan to Beersheba, meaning the entire location that Israel owned, the top part was Dan, the bottom part was Beersheba. It was the southern part, or as they like to call it, Moonshine Sheba. All right, I'm done. I'm done. No more. This is important, though, because when the Bible gives you some places and locations, it typically does it for two reasons. Number one, it lets you know this is a real place. This isn't a fictitious story. This isn't fake. This happened in a real place that you can learn about, and history proves this place existed. The second thing, though, is it helps you understand there's some recurring themes. 
And when you see a name, you can start asking yourself, well, what else happened there? Why is this name important? Why did the author decide to tell us that the, the two sons of Samuel lived in Beersheba? What we know about Beersheba is that there were multiple people who had encounters with God there. In fact, early on in the Bible, we learn that Isaac and Jacob both had dreams where God spoke to them, and it was in Beersheba. Elijah heard from God after he runs away and he's scared and he wants to hear the voice of God and God comes to him in a whisper. It's at Beersheba. So there are multiple places in Beersheba, multiple times in scripture where it says this is a special place. This is a place where you can encounter the presence of God. This is a place where you can experience God. And yet Samuel's sons were not experiencing God, which the text is giving us a warning. You can experience God. In fact, the scriptures say that if you seek God, you can find him with all of your heart. But did you also know that you can miss God even when he's present? That in Beersheba, a place literally that is historically known for people experiencing God, Samuel's sons are rejecting God and they're not experiencing him. Because God doesn't force himself on you. And God doesn't force you to obey him. And so if God doesn't have your heart, literally you can be in a room where someone is hearing from God and it just goes over your head. You, you, you miss it. And Samuel's sons weren't honoring God. They weren't serving God. And so they were missing the presence of God. Let's see what the text says next. 1 Samuel 8, 4 through 5. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old, that's hurtful, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us. Now, I want you to pay careful attention to these underlined words. Such as all the other nations have. So when you read this text, at first, it doesn't sound like it's coming from a bad place. Because what are the people saying? They're saying, God, we have judges now that are Samuel's sons, and they're not honoring to you. And they don't follow you. Give us a king. If they would have just stopped there, it would have been okay. God wouldn't have had an issue with this. Wanting a king is not an evil thing. They wanted someone to rule them. It's, it, it's the second part of this that lets us know their real heart's intention. And their heart's intention is, give us a king like all the other nations have. Well, if you paid attention to last week, why is this problematic? It's problematic because God is supposed to be their king. And they are supposed to be different than all the other nations. They're supposed to stand out. They're not supposed to be just like everyone else. So when the people come and say, God, uh, we want a king, essentially what they're saying is, God, we don't want to serve you. You connecting the dots here? The idea of a king is not sinful. In fact, multiple times in the Old Testament, God says, one day I will give you a king. Wanting a king is not a bad thing, but wanting it in the place of God, that's where sin starts. Pastor Timothy Keller, um, he recently passed away of cancer, but he says this, and I think it's very insightful. He says, sin is not simply doing bad things. It's putting good things in the place of God. Sin is not just, uh, you know, the evil things that we do, the bad things that we do. Some things that are disguised as good things, when they take the place of God, it becomes sinful. And there's nothing sinful about having a king, except for when your reasoning for wanting a king is to be like everyone else. Let's see what the text says next, 1 Samuel 8, 6 through 8. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. This request for a king is rebellion. It's rebellion. It's looking over their history and understanding that God is the one that provided safety for them to escape from Egypt. God is the one that provided meals for them when there was no food. He provided food for them in the wilderness. God is the one that delivers them and enters into the promised land. God is the one that has protected them and helped them win battles against their enemies. God is the one that's been with them from the very moment. And now they are looking at God and saying, God, you are the answer. You've always been the answer. You've provided everything we need, but we don't want you anymore. We want what everyone else has. Let's keep going in our, our scripture. 1 Samuel 8, 9. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. 
Now, this is fascinating to me because they come to God with a rebellious request, and God says, okay, give them what they want. Why would God do that? Because he loves us? Because we're not robots? And God knows ultimately that if we have a free choice, if we have free will, and we choose him, then he has our hearts. And so God doesn't force us to love him. God doesn't force us to serve him. You have the freedom to reject God or to serve God. Every human being has that freedom. You get a say in it. God's not going to force you to love him. God's not going to force you to serve him. If you want to rebel against God, if you want to say, I want nothing to do with God, he's going to say, okay, that's, that, if that's what you want, this is what you get. But understand, it comes with a warning. He loves us so much that he doesn't just say, hey, just rebel. He's like, okay, you can rebel. You can reject me as king. But there is a warning. There's some bad stuff that may happen if you go down this line. 1 Samuel 8, 10 through 18. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. <clears throat> he will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. So God says, listen, you're free people. If you want to reject me, you can. But just understand, this is what's going to happen when you make this decision. Now, I personally feel like that's a good parenting technique. If, if you haven't adopted that, I recommend you adopt it when you're raising your kids. It's something my wife and I do often. You can choose to not study for this test, and that's on you. If you want to go play with your friends and you want to play Fortnite all night, that's on you. But just understand, if tomorrow you take the test and you fail, it's not on us. Because you've chosen to do this. So you've got to then live with the consequences of your choice. My wife and I say that to our kids all the time. We're like, okay. And then sometimes we have to come back around and say, no, you still chose poorly. You are going to do this no matter what because we're the parent, you're the kid. But a lot of times we say, hey, this is your choice. It's your choice. If you want to make this decision, just know there's some ramifications that come along with it. And God says there are some ramifications that come with this request. If you want a king, understand it's going to do two primary things. And this I want to highlight for you because this is really important. He says he will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. Now remember, who is this talking to? It's talking to Israel. And where did Israel ultimately come from some almost 500 years before this? They came from slavery. And what God is saying is like, listen, hey, I know this is what you want. I know this is what everyone else is doing, but it comes with a cost. It comes with slavery. Can we just admit for a second that our poor choices come with slavery? Can we just admit that there's some decisions that we made in high school, in college, or some decisions we made as adults, and we're like, hey, I really want to do this. But then after we did it, it came with some bondage. It came with some chains. It came with some guilt, and it came with some shame. It came with some addictions. It came with some things that were like, I wish I could get free from this. Why didn't I get rid of this? Why didn't someone warn me? Well, God did. And yet in our rebellion, we continually choose to go away from him and to serve other things. Sometimes God gives us what we ask for, but just know it always comes with a warning. The second part of this is he will take a tenth of your flocks, meaning who do we give a tenth to? If people of God, when we give a tenth, that's also known as a tithe, who are we to tithe to? We are ultimately to tithe to God. And so what the text is screaming at us is that, listen, if you have an earthly king, He's going to take my place. He's going to become God, and he's going to require that you give to him. But when you give to me, I give you freedom. When you give to the man, you get slavery. Now, after all that warning, you would think, you would think that Israel would say, okay, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want slavery. 
I don't want to lose all my stuff. I don't want to give extra money to a king. But yet the people rebelled. They rebelled against God. And they said, no, 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 that is what we want. Someone sent me a, a gift last week, a meme. And uh, I, thought it was, I thought it was really appropriate for this series. It really sums up the Bible and sums up human nature. Alex Griswold says, humans in a nutshell. God, hey, you should do this. Narrator, they did not. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, you really shouldn't make yourself an earthly king. He's going to bring a lot of hurt to you. They didn't listen. Hey, if you, if you serve me, if you let me be your God, I will provide for you. Just like I have for, for literally 500 years, God had provided everything that they needed. And yet in their rebellion, they said, God, it's not enough. We want what everyone else has. The gospel tells us that we are way more rebellious than we would ever admit. But we're way more loved by God than we could ever imagine. And if you're a Christian here today, you got to understand the gospel. Because the gospel is not the beginning of Christianity. It's everything. It's A to Z. It it's literally explains why are we all so broken? Why are we all so fallen? Why do we constantly rebel? It's because it's human nature. We're not inherently good. We're inherently sinful. And that sinfulness comes with rebellion against God. And it's not just something that people did thousands of years ago. We're still doing it today. And can I tell you that God, because he loves us so much, he doesn't just let us burn in our bad choices. Because you know that God eventually provided the perfect king? His name is Jesus. But he didn't serve like earthly kings. He didn't come and say, hey, I'm going to steal things from you and take things from you. He didn't come and, and put them in slavery. In fact, Jesus in his own words said, hey, I've come to set you free. God's kingship is very different than earthly kingship. And God sees our rebellion and he knows how sinful we are. Instead of just saying, okay, fine, y'all just burn. Y'all deserve this. You just keep making bad choices. Instead of just letting us have the bad stuff that we deserve, God says, I'm going to send you a new king. His name is Jesus. And this king loves you so much. He's not going to take from you. He's going to give to you. He's going to give his own life. So why? So that you can be free. That's the gospel. The gospel is every person you know. Yeah, we're created in the image of God. We have some good things in us, but every person you know is rebellious. We're not perfect. We're not good all the time. We are way more rebellious and way more sinful than we ever like to admit, especially in church. We like to pretend that we, you know, I used to sin back in the old days. I used to sin. No, 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 no. We're all still sinners. We all still fall short of God's standards. And at every step of the way, God still loves us. And what he's asking for us every single day is that we would give him his, our hearts and that we would make him king of our lives. And if you're a Christian, the gospel is a reminder that when you wake up every day, you need God. And every day when you make choices, you are either making choices to align yourself with God or you're making choices to rebel against the king of the universe. And so often the way that we rebel is just like Israel. We claim something good and we put it in the place of God. God, I don't have time to get into the Bible and pray to you because I have a job. Jobs are good. We need to work hard, but I'm just too tired. God, I don't have time to serve for you because I just got so many other good things happening. God, I don't have time to prioritize you and, and, and to be in a group with other Christians. I don't have time because I'm prioritizing other good things. Do you see how this is still in play? What we read about today is still part of the human experience. We are constantly saying, God, what you tell me, it may be good, but I want to do my own thing. And yet God still loves us and has provided a way out. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your king, if you're here today and you'd say, okay, listen, I've been to church before. I, I, maybe I've said I believe in some things, but I've never made the declaration that God is king. Because when you make the declaration that God is king, what you're saying is that, God, you're in charge of my life, not me anymore. You're the one that gets to direct me. You're the one that gets to tell me what to do. I'm here to serve you, not you're here to serve me. I'm going to accept what that means. 
What that means is, yes, following you, I do get blessings. Yes, you're good. Yes, you do give me things, but I'm not the one that's in charge. And if you've never made that declaration, if you've met, never made Jesus the king of your life, I want to give you an opportunity to do that today with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here today and you would just say, okay, I've never made Jesus king, would you just repeat these words after me? God, I admit that I am rebellious. I admit that I've sinned. But God, I accept your invitation. I accept you as king of my life. I ask for your forgiveness of my sins. And I ask you to help me to live for you all the days of my life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.